The NVIDIA RTX 5080 is now available if you can find stock of course. The new 50 series GPUs come with improved performance, DLSS4 and some other fancy AI powered technology that will take your games to the next level. While the cards are cool to have around, what if you already have a pretty decent high end RTX 40 series GPU in your PC? A lot of people have asked me how the RTX 5080 would compare to say the RTX 4080 Super. The 4080 Super is likely the best 40 series card you can look at without nudging into the ridiculous price tag territory of the 4090. So I wanted to compare the RTX 4080 Super to the new RTX 5080. I actually own the RTX 4080 Super myself and I love the card. It really does offer some incredible power and the middle ground between the 4070 Ti and the 4090. With the 5080 on my desk, I didn't know if the upgrade would be worth it. It uses more power and costs more money of course. For those on the fence, I hope that this content helps you decide. So while this is technically reviewing the RTX 5080, it will also be focusing on the comparison between the RTX 4080 Super. For this comparison, I will be using the Aorus RTX 5080 Master Ice and the Gigabyte RTX 4080 Super Gaming OC. All the tests are being done on my daily gaming PC which includes the AMD Ryzen 9900X, 64GB of RAM clocked at 6000MTS. It also has the Aorus Waterforce 360X2 cooler and it is all powered by the X870 Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7 motherboard. Before we get into these tests, I need to show you this Aorus RTX 5080 Master Ice because this card is just something else. The Master Ice marks the high end range from Gigabyte. It comes in a pretty large box that includes the GPU and some new accessories. The accessories are a little bit different this time around. First off, the support bracket is no longer a motherboard mount. Instead, you get some metal rails and they get screwed into the GPU which is then supported by a foot. I think this mount is pretty cool, it beats being restricted by your motherboard's design. I know when I moved to the X870 board, it no longer supported the bracket that came with my RTX 4080 Super, even though both components are Gigabyte branded. The fan is also new here, it is one of the first cards to include screen cooling plus. Essentially this fan installs onto the top of the GPU and exhumes heat away from the screen cooling cutout, it helps dissipate heat. While this is cool to see, I feel like GPUs have been gargantuan in size for years now, so I can't help but wonder why this is only a thing now. Regardless, I do test this out and see whether or not it makes a difference later on. The box also includes a white 12 volt cable to match the white GPU. As for the design of this Aorus RTX 5080 Master Ice, I can't praise the card enough. It is so sleek and packs a real eye-catching design. The triple fan layout comes with the RGB halo technology that illuminates lights around the edges of the fan resulting in something truly unique. You'll also find RGB on the back side of the GPU as the Aorus logo lights up on the side. On the other side, there's also another Aorus logo next to the LCD edge view screen. This little screen can be fully customized with various sensor indicators and even your own graphics. I do prefer the customization setting called OFF. The Aorus RTX 5080 Master Ice is 360mm long, 150mm wide and 75mm thick. It packs one HDMI 2.1B port and three DisplayPort 2.1B ports. You'll need a 850 watt power supply to run this card. Overall, this is a sleek GPU. I do enjoy the dent design on the edge of it and the white shell is a change from the usual black components that I have. I am using the card in a black PC and it looks cool. I'm sure you'll want to put this in a full white build, but it does the job just fine. Putting the stats on paper, the RTX 5080 comes with 16GB of GDDR7 RAM with a memory clock of 30GB per second. The RTX 4080 Super includes 16GB of GDDRX RAM with a memory clock of 23GB per second. Both cards pack the same 256-bit memory bus. The RTX 5080 includes 10,752 CUDA cores while the RTX 4080 Super includes 10,240 CUDA cores. The core clock on the RTX 5080 is 2,805 MHz which is overclocked from the 2,617 MHz on the reference card. The RTX 4080 Super includes a core clock of 2,595 MHz which is overclocked out of the box from the 2,550 MHz on the reference card. So the RTX 5080 does have a beefier out of the box core clock. I know that Gigabyte has mentioned that the 50 series GPUs have more headroom for overclocking which is likely why we see this count so much higher than the RTX 4080 Super. So now onto the tests. I did run the benchmarks in the same environment. I used the same PC build, same settings and tried to ensure that all the game settings were identical. I also didn't touch any overclocking tweaks in the Gigabyte control center for the RTX 5080. I do have my RTX 4080 Super slightly overclocked. It is plus 160 
160 MHz with the boost clock, taking it to 2755 MHz. I also increased the power limit by 25% and the temperature limit to 88 degrees Celsius. There's also a 998 MTS increase on the memory speed, boosting it to 24 gigabytes per second. I also made sure to disable all RTX 50 series exclusive features, so I didn't run DLSS4 or multi-frame generation. I do have a few DLSS4 tests coming up later on in the review though, if you're interested to see how it performs. So the first batch of tests that you'll see are comparing the RTX 5080 to the RTX 40 Super and using the same game settings that are capable and common across both cards. The first test I ran was Black Myth Wukong. It doesn't support DLSS4 frame gen, so I disabled it on both benchmarks and in both scenarios. You can see that across both the ultra performance and the quality DLSS, the scores were quite close. This is a clear sign that the actual raw power of the RTX 5080 isn't leaps and bounds above the RTX 4080 Super. Of course, this benchmark doesn't support the path ray tracing feature which was implemented into the game after launch. This is likely where we would see the RTX 5080 take a huge jump ahead of the RTX 4080 Super. Next we have Cyberpunk 2077. I won't lie, while I enjoy the benchmark tool in the game, the entire process has become incredibly cumbersome now due to the dozens of menus and systems in the game. Regardless, the test I ran disabled frame gen and focused on raw performance. I also made sure to use the convolutional neural network DLSS to match the RTX 5080. If you don't know, the RTX 5080 uses a new transformer neural network DLSS that isn't available on the 40 series GPUs. Dying Light 2 also didn't have DLSS4 support at the time, so it was a great game to compare. I ran two tests comparing the same balanced super resolution and another test without frame gen enabled. Here you can see that the RTX 5080 has a noticeable boost in performance when frame gen is enabled. However, disabling any sort of upscaling, you can see there's minor differences. Another DLSS4 free game I tested was Dragon Age. It is quite a demanding game. Even with everything maxed out, the RTX 5080 struggled to reach 4K 60fps without the help of DLSS. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle is where the RTX 5080 shines. In its path ray tracing, it completely blew the 4080 Super out of the water. Disabling all DLSS and enabling path ray tracing, the game is only playable at around 50 FPS when set to medium only. You can't set path ray tracing to above medium on this game. On the RTX 4080, the same settings result in 8 FPS. It is completely unplayable. However, disabling path ray tracing and all the DLSS features, the performance metrics are quite similar. This is a great example to show how advanced the ray tracing performance is on the RTX 5080. Just to show you the performance of DLSS4, I did run a few extra tests here on some supported games. Of course, you can't really compare these scores to the RTX 4080 Super as it doesn't have the Transformer model DLSS technology. The tests show one thing, multi-frame generation is impressive. And this is likely where the massive performance boosts are coming from when Nvidia compares this generation's performance test to the last generation 40 series GPUs. When it comes to the screen cooling plus feature, I monitored the temperature on my PC with and without the extra fan attached to the GPU. Before I get into the stats, installation of this fan was fairly simple. There's a silicone mount that clips onto the screen cooling hole. You then slide the fan onto the silicone nubs plug the fan into your dedicated slot and you're good to go. Does it make a difference? Well, it does, but the difference is almost unnoticeable. With the fan attached, I ran the Steel Nomad stress test. The fans reached 2050 RPM, temperatures maxed out at 67 degrees Celsius, and the GPU was pulling around 360 watts of power. The fans remained at around 2100 RPM, with the sensor reading fluctuating between 66 and 67 degrees Celsius. These temperatures hovered between 66 and 67 at all times. This would likely be your best look at a standard gaming session over a long period of time. 
I then removed the fan and re-ran the same test. The fan reached 2100 RPM, but this time I noticed readings hit 69 degrees Celsius instead of 67 degrees Celsius. So instead of hovering between 66 and 67, we're now getting 68 and 69. A measly 2 degree change. I won't say that this 2 degrees were even constant, because it stayed more on 68 degrees Celsius than 69 degrees Celsius. You'll likely get better results tweaking your system fans to improve cooling in this regard. Of course, different PC builds will result in different scenarios, but I can't say that this fan made any drastic difference in performance and cooling. So comparing these two cards shows various results when you take each GPU's tech and put it head to head. When it comes to the raw performance, these cards are actually quite close, closer than we think. When it comes to path ray tracing, the RTX 5080 far surpasses the RTX 4080 Super. When it comes to DLSS3 tests, again, they show decent scores that will make any 4K 60fps game completely playable on both cards. So the RTX 5080 is great for DLSS4 and path ray tracing, two features that are still quite limited in terms of how many games support this. However, even then, the RTX 4080 Super pretty much does the same job with a simple DLSS toggle. It can easily handle path ray tracing as long as it is boosted by DLSS. In addition, when it comes to DLSS 3, most games support the technology, meaning you're not missing out on any unplayable games because they are exclusive to DLSS 4 and you need the super crazy 5080 DLSS 4 graphics card to play the game. In summary, the RTX 5080 is a fantastic card. It is definitely better on paper, but this boost in power doesn't make the RTX 4080 Super something to ignore. Both cards will likely offer similar performance across games for the next few years. Sure, DLSS comes with some cleaner image quality and multi-frame generation is really impressive. But we definitely aren't at the stage where games will rely strictly on multi-frame generation to be playable. Unless Cyberpunk 2077 wants to introduce some sort of new universal ray tracing bounce light technology that isn't possible to be played on anything but the best graphics card in the world powered by DLSS 4 because DLSS 4 multi-frame gen times 4 is the only thing on the planet that can run the technology. I think we're going to be fine. Should you get an RTX 5080? Well, if you want the best, then of course. If you want to sort of future-proof your system, then this is the GPU for you. However, the RTX 4080 Super is likely the next best thing, providing some fantastic value in comparison. I know it is a tough choice, but given the price difference, at least you can weigh things up now. So those are my thoughts on this RTX 5080 and comparing it to the RTX 4080 Super. Huge thanks to Gigabyte for sending these GPUs my way to test out. And while you're here, please do consider liking and subscribing for future content like this. Also be sure to visit glitch.online for more gaming tech news and reviews, and until next time, farewell.